this chapter is the beginning of our second session, the second section, which is uh, the second in three sections. And as I explained in the beginning, the first part we just finished laid the groundwork for American government by talking about the Constitution and the battles for uh, the powers between state and federal government, federalism, and looking at our civil rights and our civil liberties. This whole next section, the next six chapters, are all going to be about us, about our opinion, our parties, our interests, um, where we get our information. So we're going to start off uh, taking a look at public opinion polls, public opinion. Um, and the reason why we're looking at this is because politicians and government, as well as businesses uh, and entertainment, look at public opinion very seriously. They, they make decisions um, based on accurate, uh, not accurate, sorry, but reliable public opinion polls. Now there are some drawbacks and we will learn about uh, the problems with calculating public opinion, but let's get started. So first we're going to talk about where we get our opinions. So many of you in your uh, introduction, um, uh, answering your introduction question at the beginning of the semester, uh, talked about wanting to be able to form your opinions based on having accurate information. So we'll talk about where we get the sources of our opinions, how we form our opinions. We'll talk about the role of public opinion in democracy, uh, the uses of public opinion in politics and government, and a little bit of how it's measured. Now, lucky for you, this isn't a statistic class, so you don't need to learn statistics, but you will need to remember one small little, it's not even a calculation, but one small um, margin of error, which hopefully most of you have known. Um, and then we'll just talk about how American government is designed to balance our opinions with the judgment of the people that we elect. So we elect them to make decisions, but they're always looking to public opinion polls to see what we actually support, what the majority is supporting, because if they pass a law that isn't popular amongst the majority of people that will re-vote them back into office, they might think twice about doing that. So public opinion matters. It's just a matter of where we get it and how it's calculated. So before we start, uh, due to public opinion polls, uh, these uh, results have come out about millennials. and. I have this a couple times in my presentations. I think I may have already mentioned it here uh, earlier. But um, millennials have tended to get a bad rap, and so I like to show some of the really positive things about millennials. And studies show that mo millennials, on average, are more responsible, hardworking, law-abiding than the generation before. You tend to volunteer more, donate a higher share or higher percentage of your income. It might not be a higher amount than um, the generations before, but a higher percentage. And more likely to start more entrepreneurial organizations with a social impact. And are more at home in a changing, rapidly changing and diverse world than maybe your parents' generation. However, and this is in bold, so that means it will probably be on the exam, uh, millennials are less likely to vote. And then there's a however after that is that hopefully 2020 is going to change that. We did see an increase in younger uh, voters in the 2018 election, and we're hoping to see a much uh, larger increase in the 2020 election. So where we get our opinions, the sources of our opinions, this is called political socialization. Um, and as you can see from this list, there are a variety of people. Usually when I have a face-to-face -face class, I just ask people, where do you get, how do you get your information? Where, where do you think you get your opinions? And it, people usually say their parents, their friends, their teachers. Um, 
uh, people in their um, inner groups that share the same demographics as them as far as race or gender. Uh, sometimes they get um, their opinions based on whatever religion they belong to or not belong to. And then life events also um, help us to make decisions. Like I told you in my introduction, uh, September 11th was a huge event that that really propelled me to want to learn more about what was going on in the world because um, many of you may were probably just born when it happened, which is shocking to me to think that. Um, but uh, for the people that were old enough to remember and any, any of um, people my age, uh, this was a life-changing event. So sometimes life-changing events changes or propels us to become interested and um, start gathering information and gather opinions. Now your book talks about, um, has a very interesting opening, couple paragraphs, couple chapters, and uh, I, I highly suggest you read your books, but um, just so, I just want to show you what the opening story, it talked about this woman who, after Colorado had legalized marijuana, she she ate uh, a bar and was got really sick and uh, was shaking with paranoia because she didn't realize that it was supposed to be cut into 16 pieces. But it talks about um, the, the public opinion polls, how many Americans supported uh, marijuana, say, 20 years ago compared to now. And it says millennials support 71%. Um, even Republican millennials, 63%. However, the older generation are still um, not in the majority. Um, you might want to read this because it says, you know, in 2018, 30 states legalized marijuana in some form up from zero 20 years ago. And, but your book asks, is this the end of the story? Um, and we know that it is not because the Trump administration, uh, this is kind of a federalism topic, but um, the, the Justice Department reminds citizens that marijuana is still a federal offense. So it's against the law federally and um, uh, they, the Trump administration has uh, said to federal prosecutors, go ahead and bring federal cases regardless of what state laws say. Now, the Obama administration turned a blind eye to that law and just said, you know, as long as there's not a problem, the federal government is not going to step in. Um, but we, we saw how a change in public opinion poll actually pushed forward changing the laws to legalize marijuana in many states. Um, and just so you know, a different uh, presidential administration, a new president may... Um, and a new Congress may just go ahead and decide to pass a federal law and put federal um, institutions in place regarding the legalization of marijuana. Uh, the same thing with public opinion polls changed um, with same-sex marriage, um, where uh, the public opinion leaped from 31% in 2001 to 62% in 2017. And as we saw, uh, that um, may have... Um, been some kind of factor in the um, Supreme Court's passing the 2015 um, uh, result in the case that brought that made same-sex marriage legal. Uh, and then, but it, but public opinion polls don't always change things in government. As we see, uh, there's a strong public opinion. Uh, let's see, strong public views. Um, does not mean strong government action like global warming. 74% of Americans believe that global warming uh, is real, and yet when Obama was in office, they were unable to act in 2009 and pass anything in Congress. Um, Republicans signed a no climate tax pledge, um, basically brushing aside the majority view. I'm sorry, President Trump br brushes aside a majority of view and scientific consensus, as well as that no climate tax pledge uh, promised opposition to any climate change bills that required government spending. So even though public opinion is high, as far as, oops, sorry, this is the wrong chart, as far as, 
here we go, 74% uh, uh, that there is solid evidence that the average temperature in the earth is getting warmer. Uh, the government is not, this particular government is not acting on that. So uh, these are the charts here that you can look at. Um, and you can see it by age groups. So there's usually always a difference between generation. Um, but you still see a, a, a um, this one is not divided by generation, but this is how many oppose or favor same-sex marriage. So oppose went down and favor went up. All right, so let's go ahead and take a little peek at, let's see if I can move this over, um, at a, let's see, at a video, there we go, um, discussing public opinion polls. 96% of people like cheesy opening jokes, according to a survey of DNews writers. Hey there, voters. Trace here for D News. In this election year, with so much stock being put into what the polls say, it's important that they are accurate as possible. But depending on the poll, the results could be a reflection of how the nation feels as a whole or a bunch of fringe supporters skewing the outcomes. What's the science behind designing a poll that will accurately predict how the country will vote? Obviously, no poll can get a hold of everyone in the country. Otherwise, our phones would be ringing constantly. Instead, pollsters have to interview a relatively small number of people and extrapolate their data from there. They call this a sample, or N. Scientific polling organizations will aim to survey 1,000 to 1,500 people. Statistically, the result will almost always have a 3% margin of sampling error then, meaning that these people should be representative of the population's attitude, give or take 3%. They could survey more people, but after a thousand people, the margin of error doesn't really decrease much. To get the margin of error down to 1%, pollsters would have to survey 10,000 people. At that point, it's not really worth the time or effort, not to mention the money. There are other kinds of errors that go unaccounted for, like errors in analysis, where certain assumptions the researchers make about how to handle their data could turn out to be wrong and the non-response error, where people who support a candidate who's behind are less likely to respond, further skewing overall results. Polling organizations like the Pew Research Center, for example, will find participants by calling them, selecting the geographical area by area code and then the next five digits of a phone number. Then they will randomly dial the last two digits. The phone numbers randomly selected from one area are supposed to be proportional to that area's share of phone numbers in the country. The idea is to get totally random representatives from across the nation on the phone, though with more people switching to cell phones, it's gotten a bit harder to pin people down. Getting them on the phone is the first step, but the researchers know they don't have an accurate sample just yet. Older people are more likely to answer a landline, so the Pew Research Center will ask for the youngest male in the house half the time and the youngest female in the house the other half. If it's a cell phone, Yes, pollsters can and do call cell phones. They just make sure that the person is over 18. When it comes to election polling, they'll also ask if the person they're surveying plans to vote. If you don't plan to vote, your opinion doesn't really matter, at least to the outcome of the election. Then they'll ask who they plan to vote for. It's important this question comes first and that the order the candidates are listed is switched up. Asking about policy questions first can make a participant realize they don't actually agree with a candidate. Constantly listing one candidate first can also impact the survey, especially in primaries where there can be several candidates and it's hard to keep track of them over the phone. All these precautions are things online polls don't do. Their samples consist of just the website's readership, which could skew to one area, one age group, one political bias, or people who won't even vote. News organizations love to say our online poll shows, but their online poll isn't a representative sample and doesn't actually show anything except what the people who come to their website might think. Sometimes political ads even masquerade as polls, asking questions about a candidate in a negative way to sway opinion. Because scientific polls strive to eliminate as many of these confounding factors as possible, they are much more reliable than online public surveys. If you want to check out how well they perform, the National Council on Public Polls keeps track of how accurate each poll was after every election. You can check out their link in the description below. In 2012, Pew predicted Obama would win 50% to 47%, and the final tally, 51 to 47. We think...
We're pretty special with our precious democracy, but it isn't uniquely human. Julian and I explore other species that vote here. The reason. Okay, he goes on and on there. All right, so um, as if some of you saw, that was an explanation video that was uh, done in uh, 2016. And for any of you who remember the 2016 election, all the polls were wrong. So, um, uh, even the Pew polls. But basically, the, he was basically talking about the setup of polls for um, finding out who's, to try to predict who's going to win the election. But we use polls to ask all kinds of questions. Uh, this is an example. Uh, these were, Hispanic people were polled. Um, the question, the first thing that they asked them was, you know, are you Hispanic? Are you legal or not legal? Oh, I'm sorry. That's not the question they asked. Sorry. Uh, the question is about abortion being legal, non-legal. First, they'll ask them, you know, what religion are you? Uh, then in this poll, they asked them, how often do you go, do you go to worship service? And then are you foreign born or U.S. born? At this point, many people might have hung up, <laughs> but for, um, for this class sake, we're going to look at these answers. Then they ask the actual question. And the question is, um, do you think that abortion should be illegal in all or most cases or legal in all or most cases? So we get to see the breakdown of based on what religion they are, how many people think it should be illegal and legal, based on how often they go to church. So you can kind of infer different things based on whether they're U.S. born or foreign born. Uh, and then uh, your book also shows a little bit further. This question is a little bit different question. It says, do you think that um, uh, there should be smaller government with fewer services or bigger government with more services? And here they broke people down by from what nation they came from and then what religion, then male and female and U.S. born and foreign born. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see um, the answers based on these different demographic. Uh, these are called demographics, uh, race, gender, um, economic status, uh, stuff like that. So the way we can break down different groups of people. Uh, so also besides family, friends, education, um, certain indicators will be strong predictors of what our um, opinions are. Being a member of the Republican or the Democratic Party is a strong predictor of your opinion. So if someone knows that you are one or the other, they can kind usually predict, it's a strong predictor that you they know how you will answer. Um, but this isn't always true. And we're seeing more and more people that are disenfranchised with these two parties, more and more independents. So that's um, just one indicator. Another indicator is um, our pocketbooks. Uh, ex economic self-interest matters the most. So people with more money will vote for lower taxes. People with less money will probably vote to expand some social programs where maybe they get student loans or um, some kind of housing subsidy or uh, uh, um, health care. Uh, poor Americans likely affiliate with Democrats. Um, wealthy Americans are divided. And, and that's not necessarily true because we know that there have been a lot of poor Americans that were um, in economic crisis that voted for Trump this year, this past election. Uh, another source of public opinion is elite influence, uh, people that are um, politicians or celebrities or people that speak out might have an influence on how we view things. If we watch something, um, you know, a woman speak out in the Me Too movement, that might be an elite influence if it's a famous actress or somebody who has um, taken a court case uh, to uh, court. Um, also, wars and other focusing events can also be a source of our public opinion. So, and then our public opinion changes, shifts a bit depending on um, events. 
So in general, do you think uh, this, this is a trend of public opinion polls, the same question asked year after year? Um, and so the purple line is people who think that we should have more strict um, gun laws, uh, sale of firearms, uh, keep the laws the same, and the yellow is less strict. So as you can see, usually you'll see an uptick whenever there is um, some kind of um, mass shooting, which we could see uh, in 2018 here. Um, probably was represented by the shooting in Las Vegas, among others. So uh, public opinion polls are a systematic study of a defined population. So like he was saying, you know, they, you pick a random population of uh, various cities or uh, various regions across the United States. And then you analyze a representative sample. And he and the guy in the video talked about a representative sample would be 1,000 to 1,500 people would get uh, the amount, uh, as close to an accurate amount as we can scientifically. Um, and we would draw inferences about the larger public's view. So we take 1,500 people's opinions, and we're able to say that more than likely within a margin of error of uh, plus or minus three, 73% uh, of Americans think that global warming is real. Um, your book talks about polling bloopers. Uh, we know that um, the presidential election in 2006, everyone was wrong. The other one that's talked about in your book was a poll that was given out into this um, this literary digest in the 1920s. And they basically were asking which president would win. Um, and they overwhelmingly supported the president that wasn't the winner. <laughs> and the reason why was because the sample that they took were people who could afford to have this literary digest uh, delivered to their house and maybe even had the time to fill it out and send it in. And so they basically got the opinion of only wealthier people, people with homes. Um, it was right around the time of the Depression, and um, uh, they, were, they were completely wrong, and just like they were in the 2016 election. So here we have, beginning in the 1920s, the Literary Digest relied on subscriber postcards to successfully predict each presidential winner. In October of 1936, uh, the Digest forecasted a lopsided defeat. For They just figured that Franklin D. Roosevelt would lose, and he went on to win the biggest landslide in the century. He took every state but two. Um, so they were very off because they tended to be wealthy people who did not uh, did not like President Roosevelt or his policies. Polls must accurately reflect everyone's views, not just the segment of the population that you poll. So that's why it's important to get the proper sample. Okay, so we get a random sample, like the video described, use the area code and then the first Six digits are the same, and then random random selection of the last two digits. Uh, this is everyone in the population has an equal probability to be selected. And the sampling frame is a designated group of people from a set of poll respondents is randomly selected. So varying demographic groups. So we're not going to get all young people. We'll get varying ages, um, a pretty much equal amount of male, female, um, various races and various income um, levels. Sometimes we have to refine the sample. Like he said, we're not going to ask um, people who are not registered to vote and not planning on voting or not voting age or unable to vote. So we'll, we'll refine the sample to only likely voters if the question is about, obviously, about elections. Um, the timing of the polls matters. If you ask someone right now who they're planning on voting for uh, for president next year, you might get a different answer than you will next summer when the Democratic Party will have a candidate. 
um, the wording of the sentences. If you ask someone, uh, are you likely to vote for candidate A? Um, that's pretty straightforward, but if you say, are you likely to vote for candidate A, knowing that he might have stolen from seniors, um, and something that might even be a lie, uh, the framing and the wording affects the way people answer. And speaking of that, uh, we have what are called push polls, and this probably should be highlighted, but push polls is negative campaigning. They're not really concerned about keeping track of what your answers are. They're just trying to persuade you in a certain way. So the one I just, uh, the example I just said is a push poll, basically trying to push someone. What? Uh, someone is, um, you know, steals from seniors? No, I don't want to vote for someone like that. And the other problems are technology, um, like he was saying, online polls have their own problems. And also we've been so used to most polls being done by landlines. Now we also get poll calls on our cell phones. But how many of you have received a call that sounds like it's going to be a public opinion poll and have hung up on it? Probably many of us. <laughs> um, but maybe you'll think different after we finish this chapter. And then the, the margin of error, and this is in bold because you need to um, understand this. So this is if, uh, I usually let you guess, but um, since I don't have a chalkboard to write on, if 73% of Americans think that global warming is, um, is real and the margin of error is plus or minus 3, that means that anywhere from 70% to 76%. So this is a very, uh, this is what scientists believe is um, a sufficient margin of error. If you had, if you said 73% of Americans um, believe global warming is real and you, you had a plus or margin of error plus or minus 20, that would mean 53 to 93. That's too big of, way too big of a, a margin of error and that just means that we have no idea that we, we can't even narrow it down. So you want to look at polls that have a margin of error of uh, plus or minus three. And like he said, trying to get even better than that, plus or minus one, you end up spending way more money and time than, than it takes to, um, than it's worth. Uh, the other, as far as the sample size, so he said that uh, polls usually try to get a thousand um, people, a thousand calls, a thousand responses to a thousand five hundred to try to get plus or minus three. Uh, if you ask only 10 people, your margin of error is going to be plus or minus 35. That's not going to work. And it goes down uh, maybe a hundred people. You still have plus or minus 10. That's still quite high. So the magic number is somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 respondents. Now that doesn't mean, that means you might have to call 5,000 people or 10,000 people in order to get 1,000 responses because many people hang up, many people don't finish the call, many people like me argue with the poller saying, that's not a very fair question, I don't like the way that's worded. <laughs> uh, okay, they, it doesn't help them at all. All right, so uh, this is uh, polling the same uh, question, what is your top global threat in various countries? So hopefully you'll be able to see this. When I show this in my classroom, it looks like uh, Russia is afraid of Russia, but um, Russia's top um, global threat is economic instability, and then these two countries here that are next to Russia, their top threat is Russia. Um, as well as I believe this is um, Vietnam or Cambodia or whatever, and that their um, their biggest threat is China, uh, North America's ISIS, Australia's ISIS, and then all of these countries in green is climate change. So this is an older poll, uh, maybe a couple years ago. Things might have changed recently, but that's the poll that we still have in the book. Uh, there's different types of polls. I told you about a push poll, which is negative, um, negative campaigning. There are benchmark polls. This is like if you're running for 
election, you'll take a poll at the very beginning of your campaign, and then you'll be able to say how what percentage you've increased your popularity as the time gets closer to the election. Straw polls are quite informal. They're usually carried out by party organizations or news outlets. They're not very reliable. Exit polls also are not very reliable. This is happens on election day, usually done by news stations or political parties or campaigns, just wanting to get the results faster than the official results coming in. So you have someone standing outside of polls and saying, who'd you vote for? Who'd you vote for? With a microphone shoving in your mouth or with their pen ready to write down. Many people don't respond to that. Uh, they're not always reliable, but that's how news stations try to get an idea of who's ahead in the polls. I mean, who's ahead in the, yeah, in the polls, in the election polls. All right, and your book will, talks about three different effects. So these are effects on us. If we look at, and let's, let's we're talking about um, coming up to an election. If we look at opinion polls, the results, we're listening to the radio and we say, oh, you know, uh, I don't know, 60% of the population voted, uh, voted for Hillary, so she's probably going to win. Um, then if you're a voter and you're undecided, you, you don't know between Trump or Hillary, and you just decide, oh, well, 60% are going for um, Hillary, then you get on the bandwagon and you go ahead and vote the same way as the polls are showing. That's called the bandwagon effect. The boomerang effect would be when you hear public opinion polls and um, the candidate who is consistently ahead in the opinion polls ends up um, people here. So, so you hear, oh, Hillary's ahead by six, you know, 60%. And you go, okay, well, they probably don't need my vote. I'll just stay home because then it's a boomerang effect and then that candidate loses. The underdog effect is when you hear, the, well, you're not too sure who to vote for. And I guess I shouldn't use the two presidential <laughs> candidates from the last election. But say it's candidate A and candidate B and candidate A is way ahead and you feel sorry for candidate B so you go and vote for candidate B. And then a lot of people do that, and then the candidate, the underdog, ends up winning. So that those are the, the three effects. So you should be familiar with these. There'll probably be a question on the exam of that. Um, your book talks about two philosophies. Uh, one is called um, is by a gentleman Walter Lippmann. He wrote uh, "The Masses Are Asses," and his uh, look at public opinion was that we don't know what we're talking about. And he says, the typical American was or is distracted by celebrity shenanigans and minor scandals, rarely follows policy issues closely enough to understand the details, and yet readily offers up personal views on any topic. Does that sound familiar? Because that was written like almost 100 years ago. <laughs> but his idea was that, hey, we can't ask the general public because we're ignorant. We don't know. And this public opinion poll is just a tool to manipulate us. And so um, American public opinions are meaningless and we should just depend on the experts or the lawmakers to make the decisions for us. So that's one view. And that view we're going to, for our sake, call the masses are asses or the ignorant masses. The second view is a little bit more recent. 1992, a book was written by two political scientists, um, Benjamin Page and Robert Shapiro. And they basically said that while maybe a single voter or a poll respondent may not hold, uh, may hold inconsistent or even self-contradictory notions, um, but put together collectively with tens of millions of voters, it's important to know what, what the public wants and what the public thinks. So taken as a whole, the public can differentiate among alternative policies. So uh, health care that is cheaper and health care that is more expensive or health care that's available, uh, the American public can have an opinion about that. So um, just as long as they have all the information, how much of my taxes are going to go up, what kind of health care is it, but we can make certain um, uh, we can give our opinion on. We might not understand the makings of nuclear fission, 
or something more complicated, but their idea is that we are a rational public and if you can get enough of us together collectively we can figure out what the public believes in, what they want. And we have what are called informational shortcuts and these are cues about candidates or policies that are drawn from everyday life. So if you have experienced filling out your FAFSA to apply for a Pell Grant, uh, then you have this informational shortcut because you have this, this experience of filling it out and receiving it. And so you know that the government has these programs that helps people go to school that might not make, um, uh, the stu students who don't make enough money to be able to afford to go to school, they can get a little bit of help from Pell Grants. Um, that's just one example. Or if you have an elderly parent that lives with you and is collecting Social Security, um, if you've gone to the Social Security office and someone has explained that to you, you, you have some information. Um, or, or uh, like I often do, is um, go to some comedians that, um, or some television programs that explain a difficult issue. These are called informational shortcuts, and I don't have that in bold, um, although I should. Uh, but that will probably there'll probably be a question on the exam about that. All right, moving on. So, if public opinion is a guide to government, then there are three conditions that must be met. And the first one is that we have to know what we want. So um, we have to have enough information to be able to actually have an opinion. Um, and then the public has to be clear about communicating that to the political leaders. It's not always through public opinion polls, and as we will talk about in uh, political participation in the next lecture, uh, we have to actually pick up the phone or pick up a pen and paper and send a letter to, or, or a keyboard and send an email to our representatives and tell them what we want. So the public must clearly communicate to their political leaders what they want. And then the political leaders must pay attention to the public views. Now it's easy for them to wake up in the morning and say, what do the public opinion polls say? That's much easier than answering every phone call. But um, I always like telling this story when we talk about political participation. One of my students, uh, one of the extra credit projects that I gave my face-to-face -face classes was that if they went out, and actually I think it's one of your questions, it's your discussion question, yeah. If they went out and did something, um, some kind of political participation and called their representative about an issue that they were interested in, and this woman, she, her father was a vet and he had just died and her mother was living off of um, his vet um, benefits and they discontinued when he died, but she was owed a certain amount, but it was taking them so long because the, um, the Veterans Administration is so backed up. And for her project, she called uh, Catherine Cortez Masto, and she wrote about this and said, um, I just expected you know, an answering machine or a staff to pick up. And they, they took down her message, a staff did answer, they took down her message, or maybe she left a message, I can't remember. But she got a call back from the senator, and the senator said that I, I'll do what I can and was able to speed up the matters um, to help her mom get her benefits faster. Um, so the squeaky wheel gets the oil, so it, it pays to contact your political leaders. All right, um, then these two terms you need to know. So survey research is another word for polls. This is the way, it's the systematic study of the defined population. So we, it's the same um, definition as public opinion polls. So a public opinion poll is also called a survey or survey research. So if you have a question on your exam, you should know this definition of what it is. And then a mandate, this is, um, this is not law, but it's, it's custom that it's the political authority that a politician claims to have because they won the election. And so basically whatever they ran on in their campaign. So for example, 
uh, the current president ran on building a wall and all of, uh, he was voted into office, not by a majority of Americans, but he got the electoral college majority. And so the people that voted for him, he felt like they, the, he had the political authority that was claimed by what he ran on. Um, and so he, uh, it basically means that a politician feels like they have a responsibility. They have a mandate from the people to do what they said they were going to do. So um, we're seeing that develop now by the building of a wall of whatever degree the wall is being built in various places, including Colorado. Okay, sorry. That, <laughs> uh, I know that was... Sometimes I can't help myself. All right, then let's see. The, two more uh, various uh, vocabulary that you need to know. Approval rating. This is pretty self-explanatory. It's a measure of public support. So politicians, usually, my son-in-law worked for um, the, the Harry Reid, the senator of Nevada, and also Dina Titus now. And one of, the, one of the things that he told me is that every morning they wake up and they get their approval rating. Um, they, they look at the polls and they see what their approval rating is. And they also look at how many people called about certain issues. They get a tally of how many people called about health care, how many people called about whatever policy they're working on. So they're concerned about approval rating because they want to get reelected. Uh, another term is policy agenda. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the next chapter, but this consists of the issues that the media covers, that the public considers important, and that politicians address. And this sets the agenda of what policies will be looked at. So, for example, if there's a mass shooting, who covers it? The media covers it. People pay attention. They watch the media. And then the politicians have to act on it. Or not. Uh, if there's something that the politicians want to bring, they will go to the media and they will address it. And then hopefully the public will pay attention and they'll get the public support. Sometimes the public will come out with something like have a protest and then the media comes and covers it. And now the politicians have to pay attention to the media. So it's kind of like a triangle. One of them starts, the others have to start paying attention. And this is, it, any, of, any of these three groups of people can help put a policy on the agenda, which is something that Congress should pay attention to and pass some laws on. Okay, so for um, your exam, uh, the things you need to pay attention to in this chapter is the millennial uh, statistics. The sources of political socialization, so family members, uh, religion, uh, schools, places where you get your, your political socialization, your political views. Um, you should know the definition of opinion polls, which is also the same definition of survey research. You should be familiar with the literary digest story. There'll probably be a question about that. You should know the margin of error, plus or minus three is the ideal margin of error, and understand what that means. You should review the types of polls, the types of effects that polls have on elections, uh, the two, and the two theories on public opinion, the masses or asses by Walter Lippmann and the rational public by Page and Shapiro. Okay, uh, that's it for today, and see you again on the next lecture.